my colleague and then I'll type live in the chat and uh, we can get going. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Ted Opitz and I'm a director of the NATO Association of Canada, a charitable NGO dedicated to informing Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Thank you all for taking the time this afternoon to participate in what will be a most informative presentation. You know, most Canadians don't have to give a second thought about their peace and security. The NATO Association strives to remind our fellow Canadians just how amazing that really is and that it is possible because Canada is part of a collaborative alliance dedicated to mutual defense to maintain peace. Today, we're going to discuss the evolving challenges to peace and security found in the annual Global Peace Index Report produced by the Institute for Economics and Peace. And taking us through the discussion in a few moments will be our guest moderator, Jessica Duque. Jessica is the Outreach and Development Officer at the Institute for Economics and Peace, where she manages IEP's public engagement and education efforts in the United States and Americas more broadly. This includes actively engaging with high-level, multilaterals, civil society organizations, universities, and other research institutes to expand IEP's network and reach. After our discussion, we will be opening the floor for questions from our live YouTube audience. So if you're watching live, please start typing in any questions you may have now or throughout the discussion. Before I pass it off to Jessica, I would like to remind you all to subscribe to our YouTube channel, NATO Canada, and to join our membership in supporting Canada's role in NATO and the rules-based international order. And with that said, Jessica, over to you. Thank you so much, Ted. I'm excited to be part of this discussion around the Global Peace Index. Um, I wanna begin by introducing our two speakers, Michael Collins and Kevin Wong. Michael is the Executive Director for the Americas at IEP, where he develops partnerships in North and Latin America and focuses on expanding IEP's positive peace framework as a training tool and an evidence-based metric for peace-centered development. And Kevin serves on the board of NATO Association of Canada and is also vice president and COO at Delphic Research Group. He also founded an organization called Take Care Supply, which developed Canada's first evidence-based reusable mask. Among other accomplishments, Kevin is also a contributor on News Talk 1010, proudly serves in the Royal Canadian Navy at Her Majesty's Canadian Ship York, and is a professor at Western University. Michael, I'd like to first hand the floor over to you to present the findings of the GPI. Excellent, thank you very much, Jessica. And with your permission, I'm just gonna quickly go ahead and share my screen here. And, uh, some things always get, tend to get in the way. Let's see, excuse me. There we are. Excellent, great. So I'm going to go um, uh, pretty much straight into sharing some some uh, key findings from this year's Global Peace Index report. But I will touch very quickly on on basically the work of the Institute for Economics and Peace. Essentially, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan research institution, and we're dedicated to shifting the world's focus to peace as a positive, tangible, and achievable measure of human well-being and progress. We do that primarily through the development of quantitative uh, reports, including the Global Peace Index, but also the Global Terrorism Index, the Positive Peace Index, and then thematic and subnational reports as well. And, um, you know, this, this research is consulted by a variety of multilateral organizations and governments around the world, used extensively uh, in new universities, and consulted a lot online. We have a very strong media presence. Now, this is somewhat of a sort of a promotional slide, I suppose you could say, but you know, I kind of sort of like to use it to show the, the distinct appetite that there seems to be to developing a deeper understanding of peace and the factors that create peace over time. Um, so this kind of sort of reception has enabled us uh, to open a variety of offices around the world. Uh, today we're calling in from uh, New York, but hopefully for anybody from, uh, from NATO or formerly from uh, NATO, there is an IEP office in a time zone near you. We've been doing the uh, Global Peace Index for about 15 
years now. Um, basically, it ranks 163 countries around the world according to their relative state of peace. Now, we use 23 indicators that I'm going to jump into in a moment, and we use sort of a methodology for making these globally comparable and banding them and comparing them that's developed by IEP, but it is overseen by an international panel of experts. Now, with regards to these three indicators, they correspond to essentially three domains. The first one is with, with regards to domestic and international uh, conflict, uh, including the number of battle deaths, for example, relations with neighboring countries, and the intensity of organized conflict. The second one uh, is, is a sort of internal dynamics within a country, mostly uh, measures of societal safety and security. And this is what tends to be um, weighted the strongest on the index. And, you know, the, the general premise here is that, uh, you know, in order to be able to um, be an effective peace builder abroad or in order to not generate conflict abroad, you first need to have your own house in order. And then the third one, which, um, you know, often offers debate, especially um, with audiences like this, is levels of militarization. Now, we don't really sort of pass any kind of judgment on um, whether, um, uh, um, you know, what kind of sort of militarization or what uh, size of military is optimal in any given country. Um, there are always going to be uh, bad apples um, that, you know, none of us, I don't think at this point, can imagine a society that is completely peaceful. The objective is, of course, that and in a peaceful society, you would not have jails, you would not have police, and you would have no need for the military. So what we see in militarization is not necessarily a bad thing, but certainly a symptom of an underlying lack of peacefulness or a fear of peacefulness as well. So happy to expand on this if, uh, um, as needed, of course. So let me go ahead and jump straight into some of the key findings for this year. This is an interactive map that you can actually consult directly on our webpage. If you're interested in the outcome of a particular country, you, you'd be able to click on that and glean some information. Um, overall, peacefulness deteriorated uh, slightly last year, 0.07%. Um, it's the smallest deterioration in the index, but it is the ninth deterioration in the last 13 years. Now, 80, 87 countries became more peaceful and 73 countries became less peaceful. So more countries became more peaceful, but the actual amount of improvement was less. Countries tend to deteriorate in peacefulness a lot more than countries improve in peacefulness. The improvements were generally driven by uh, changes in ongoing uh, conflicts, generally kind of sort of the wind, the ongoing wind down of some of the larger wars around the world, um, a reduction in, uh, in the impact of terrorism, and deteriorations primarily driven by militarization, specifically an increase in military expenditure, which is a change in a trend that we've been seeing over the last, over the last 10 years or so, um, and deteriorations in the safety and security domain, primarily in terms of civil unrest. So delving into this uh, sort of a tiny bit more and, and specifically in terms of civil unrest, we've seen the number of violent demonstrations last year significantly increase. We saw over 15,000 uh, violent uh, events last year, uh, parallel to causing or, 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 or correlative to uh, an increase in political stability. Uh, I mentioned militarization briefly before, 97 countries deteriorated, 100 countries uh, increased their military expenditure last year. In terms of improvements, well, we've seen this reduction in deaths from internal uh, conflict, uh, the number of intensity of internal conflict as well, and deaths from terrorism uh, have reduced. That's sort of a part of a longer term trend as well. So Iceland is once again the most peaceful uh, country in the world. No surprises there as it's been the most peaceful country since the inception of, of the index. Ukraine and Iraq had the largest uh, improvement specifically for last year. Um, do bear in mind, of course, that Iraq is actually one of the least peaceful countries on uh, in the world, but nonetheless has improved significantly since the uh, end of the war with ISIS. Uh, the Middle East, the MENA region, uh, has had the largest improvement, but it does remain the least peaceful region in the world currently. Uh, Europe remains the most peaceful region, although it has had a deterioration in political stability and increase in violent demonstrations. Now, if you always sort of look at the, at the tail end and some of the deteriorations here, Afghanistan remains the world's least peaceful nation. I did recall, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, record a small increase in peacefulness. And of course, we'll need to see the outcome of a lot of the things happening this year. Um, Burkina Faso and Belarus recorded the largest deteriorations, and North America had the largest regional deterioration, owing to increases in violent demonstrations. Now, we have seen that in Canada, but this, this um, specific metric is largely related to the United States. Essentially, there are only two countries in the North American uh, region. 
um, uh, South America and Central America and the Caribbean were the second and largest uh, and third uh, largest deteriorations respectively. So we could say that the whole of the Western uh, hemisphere was by far the largest deteriorator in peacefulness over the last year. Here's the ranking of the, of the top 10 uh, countries. Now, if you look down on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see that Canada has deteriorated. Canada actually increased um, in peacefulness last year. Um, now, when you get to sort of the top of the table here, any really small difference can actually have a large change in rank. So even the fact that uh, even though it improved in peacefulness, other countries within this ranking here improved more in peacefulness, and therefore Canada's ranking went down, um, but it continues to be in the top 10 globally and has been for some time. Uh, this is actually kind of sort of the small uh, small breakdown that you can see of, of Canada more specifically. Um, let me just uh, get something out of the way here. Excellent. Uh, as you can see, a small deterioration over the last year, um, but a, uh, um, uh, you know, a sort of a maintenance, I suppose you could say, a slight improvement in peacefulness over the last 10 years. What we see here, if we look on the, on the right hand side, is we see an improvement in overall score. We see a general improvement in levels of militarization over that time, a general improvement in ongoing conflict, and then a number of ups and downs in terms of sort of safety and security over the last 10 years, um, and uh, uh, an increase in that in recent times. Right down at the bottom of the table, Afghanistan, I think I mentioned before, continues to be the least peaceful country on earth. Um, and Yemen uh, is one that sort of has continued to deteriorate significantly, although currently there's, I suppose you could say there's a bit of a stalemate in the country. It is now the, the least peaceful country um, in the MENA region. So let's touch on COVID-19 and peace um, that, have, has, of course, has had a sort of significant impact on peacefulness. We find that it tends to be both positive and negative in the sense that at least early on, we did see significant reductions in things like violent crime and things like uh, homicide in some cases as much as 50%, even 80, 80% 80 um, in some specific countries. But as countries have kind of sort of opened up after the pandemic, we've tend to see these uh, forms of violence um, increase again. Um, civil unrest has um, increased significantly uh, last year, there was an initial drop due to COVID, uh, but overall uh, it's increased 10% in 2020. So out of, the, out, uh, out of those 15,000 um, events that I mentioned before, uh, 5,000 of those were um, uh, generally uh, COVID related. Um, political instability uh, deteriorated in 46 countries. Of course, COVID-19 definitely exacerbated a lot of those uh, tensions, especially tensions between countries as well. And, you know, perhaps just one of the things to note is that a lot of the long-term impact of the pandemic, we're really not going to be able to see for quite some time yet. And of course, you know, very largely tied to that uh, is, um, you know, the, the question of sort of what the economy will be like um, in any individual country. Now, this is kind of sort of a, a map of essentially the um, the, the number of sort of uh, pandemic related incidents uh, during last year, I believe it was from April, March last year to essentially April this year. Unfortunately, Canada isn't included in this. Uh, we use, um, this is a specific um, a database set up by ACLED that currently doesn't have coverage uh, in Canada, but you can see the breakdown for, for the rest of, of, the, of the world here. Now, in terms of, of recovery, I mentioned briefly that sort of the economic recovery is going to be sort of key to determining whether civil unrest is going to continue to grow in the next year. Um, and, you know, our feeling is that countries with high levels of positive peace are best placed to recover quicker from the pandemic. So for those of you who may not be familiar with some of our, our work on positive peace, um, what IEP does is we take results from the Global Peace Index, and then um, we've compared those to thousands of different socioeconomic and um, cultural and attitudinal uh, data sets to be able to try and determine what are the underlying socioeconomic factors that are, are leading to change, subsequent changes in levels of peacefulness around the world to essentially sort of try and get to what are the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peace. So we do, um, have this parallel report called the Positive Peace Index, which tracks these characteristics in countries over time. Countries with high levels of positive peace perform a lot better um, in a variety of different ways, including in resilience to all forms of crisis, including things like COVID-19. So just to give an example of that, in OECD countries, countries with, with high levels of positive peace um, had much lower unemployment rates due to COVID than countries with low positive peace. 
um, taking that sort of one step further in terms of identifying potential countries that are ideally placed to respond to COVID-19, Czech Republic, Estonia, Germany, uh, Lithuania, and the other countries that you see here, not only have high levels of positive peace, but they also have relatively low levels of external debt. So touch on trends in peace. Um, this really kind of sort of helps us see the momentum over time. So we track everything over at least a 10 year period. We see that it's declined since 2008. As you can see here, um, uh, the ninth deterioration in 13 years, which I, I believe I mentioned before, and just breaking down sort of the domains a bit, we see this increase in violent demonstrations is by no means simply due to COVID. It's been a, a trend that we've been seeing for a number of years now, although it has been significantly accelerated by COVID. We've seen the number of forcibly displaced people around the world continue to increase, and perhaps counterintuitively, uh, despite uh, all of the, the craziness that we're, that we're seeing, we've seen this uh, ongoing drop in homicide rates around the world, which is reason for optim uh, optimism for sure. If we look into uh, ongoing conflicts, we see that it's um, significantly higher than it was in 2008, but nonetheless has dropped significantly since the height of the war in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the total number of conflicts around the world has continued to increase, although there was a small decrease uh, at the tail of end of this, partly related to uh, COVID. And what we're seeing is we're seeing kind of sort of a lot of the, 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 the larger theaters um, uh, coming to an end, but a lot of sort of more smaller regional, but equally intense conflicts coming about around the world. We talked about militarization briefly before. Over the last um, 10, 12 years, we have seen a significant decrease in militarization around the world. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've actually seen that trend start to change um, and, and to see an increase in, in military expenditure, um, but also um, um, you know, other elements related to weapons exports, weapons import, the availability of small arms, et cetera, et cetera. Broadly, very broadly speaking, we continue to see this rising uh, increase in what we call sort of the peace gap. This is a measure of the 25 least peaceful countries and the 25 most peaceful countries. And we see that while the most peaceful countries have continued to become more peaceful generally, the least peaceful countries have continued to become least peaceful, caught in the violence trap in a vicious circle. So I just wanted to kind of sort of uh, end, uh, although it's probably about four slides left, um, on some research that we have started to do with Lloyd's Register. Um, and they have uh, conducted a world risk poll um, that, they, um, uh, that has been done by, by Gallup, uh, essentially 150,000 people in nearly 145 countries around the world. And we've analyzed a subset of the questions that were asked as they relate to violence around the world. So the four questions were, overall, do you feel more safe, less safe, or about as safe as you did five years ago? Um, what is the greatest source of risk to your safety in your daily life? Are you very worried, somewhat worried, or not worried that violent crime could cause you serious harm? And then fourthly, have you or someone you know personally experienced serious harm from violent crime in the past two years? So we've done some global kind of sort of analysis of this. It's only preliminary at this point, And I do have to say that this is prior to COVID, or at least these, these results are prior to COVID. Uh, Lloyd's is currently undertaking another survey with the same questions to be able to see what the impact of COVID has been. Now, overall, in terms of experience um, of violence, uh, nearly 20% of the people worldwide have experienced violence or know somebody who has experienced violence in the last two years. Now, one out of seven people, just under 15% of people, um, rate uh, violent crime uh, homicide and terrorism as their largest risk um, to safety, uh, just underneath road accidents. Although it should be said that this kind of sort of varies significantly depending on the region and the country. So for example, in some countries that can be as much as 50%, as you can see here. The fear of violent crime, globally 60% of people are worried about sustaining serious harm from violent crime. Somewhat counter to this, 75% of people feel as safe or more safe than they did five years ago. Now, when we uh, break this out per uh, uh, gender, uh, we're able to see that there are some differences between male and female responses, uh, although they're not necessarily significant. And also it's difficult to discern any major patterns because of the great variety between different countries. But overall, um, uh, women tend, um, uh, tend to report being more uh, fearful 
of violence than men globally. Um, although for um, reporting of experience of violence, the opposite, the opposite of, uh, is true. Men tend to report experiencing more violence um, than women on the same percentage. Uh, this is kind of sort of a, just a one, you know, one map related to the fear of violence specifically. And as you can see, um, um, uh, Latin America um, uh, is one of sort of the highest ranked in terms of uh, a fear of violence. And I believe we have a, uh, Oh, a few examples of just countries. And as you can see, there's a radical kind of sort of uh, difference in different countries around the world. Generally, we see a high correlation um, uh, between experience of violence and fear of violence, somewhat obviously, and thankfully we do see that correlation, although you, there are certain countries in which it's radically different. In the case of Japan, the actual experience of violence is 3%, as you can see here, but the actual fear of violence is, is, is over 30%. And you know, counter to that, uh, Sweden, for example, um, it is um, reports to 25% of people report experiencing violence, whereas only 11% of people actually report a fear of violence. So significantly different interpretations, significantly different changes depending on the country that you're in. Uh, this is some more um, uh, country uh, reporting based on feelings of safety um, and greatest risk. And this is kind of sort of an agglomeration of, uh, of what you would see at a regional level. So if you kind of sort of look at North America here, you can see that uh, overall we're looking at relatively uh, a few people being fearful of violence, 21% in this particular case. Uh, North America, and of course, bear in mind, this is both the US and, and Canada. In terms of feeling of safety, 25%. Uh, so that's 75% feel of people feel that they are more safe than uh, five years ago. Um, in terms of experience of violence, 22%, and in terms of uh, violence as the greater uh, risk, 10.5% um, uh, of people. Here's a small breakdown for Canada specifically. Uh, what you see in red here are feelings of safety reported by women, um, and, um, uh, um, and uh, basically the other ones as well, for a violent experience of violence at greatest risk, and the ones um, in blue, are the ones reported by men. This is actually opposite of what you would see as the global average. So in North America and in some European countries, um, women report more experience of violence than men. Um, and um, pretty much by, the, by these uh, percentages, when you look at it um, in, in other parts of the world, uh, it's the other way around. So that's kind of sort of an interesting uh, thing to note. Now, Sort of in closing, uh, and perhaps um, just going back to positive peace very briefly, uh, the gap between positive peace and negative peace, we are finding is a strong predictor of future uh, trends in peacefulness. So we have this thing that we basically call a positive peace surplus or deficit. You know, if a country ranks relatively highly on the global peace index, which we call, we call a negative peace or a superficial peace, right? But we see that these underlying attitudes, institutions, and structures that we measure are really sort of uh, low on the ranking, right? The country ranks very lowly on the positive peace index. Then there is a high likelihood that that country is going to deteriorate in peacefulness over the time. But it does take things like, for example, COVID-19 for that to happen in many cases. So just as a sort of a case in point of the 10 countries with the largest deteriorations in peacefulness between 2009 and 2019, seven of those had the largest positive peace deficits in 2009. So we're basically going into 2009 with with very low levels of underlying resilience. Um, if you expand sort of the definition of the, de of the deficit to more than 50 places, let's say that you are, just to give you an example, 10th on the global peace index, but you are 60th on the positive peace index, um, then 90% of those countries um, recorded uh, substantial deteriorations by 2019. So we are finding that it is acting as a very good predictor for future falls in peacefulness, something to consider. And here's some of kind of sort of the, the, the countries that we're seeing have uh, um, as had the largest deteriorations uh, in positive peace deficits in 2020. Uh, places like uh, Eritrea um, are other countries that have also been deteriorating significantly in, uh, in positive peace. That pretty much closes uh, me out. If you'd uh, like to find out more about positive peace, we have a whole variety of resources, a lot of them non-technical um, for, educa for um, educational purposes, for audience that may be less interested in the data and more interested in the philosophy. There's the Positive Peace Academy as well. And uh, I'll leave it there. Look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Michael. I feel like there's a lot of insight in there. So happy to delve more deeply into that during the Q&A. 
Um, but for now, Kevin, I'd love to invite you onto the floor to share your thoughts and kind of ground these findings um, from the perspective of NATO. So Kevin, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Jessica. So before I begin, I'll just reiterate that obviously everything that I'll be sharing is of my own civilian opinion, not at all reflective of any of my employers or various affiliations other than the NATO Association of Canada. So with that out of the way, before we can really talk about post-COVID recovery and what it means for peace, we have to look at COVID's impact. And if we look at how it's impacted Canada, you'll see that it's killed sadly, more than 24,000 Canadians. And if COVID was a conflict, it would be Canada's third deadliest in history. It's also had a profound impact on the Canadian economy. We suffered our worst three month stretch um, on record in the second quarter when the economy came to a near halt in April. And it was the worst posting for the economy that has ever been recorded in history, uh, which dates all the way back to 1961. There has never been an annualized rate of 38.7% in a contraction in the, in the economy. And almost 3 million Canadians or nearly one in 10 had lost their jobs. That has been COVID's impact in Canada. And yet, while Canada was fighting COVID at home, we continued our work abroad fighting for the support of peace and democracy around the world. Throughout the greatest global health crisis in a century, Canada has not shied away from our global commitments. This is because we know that peace and safety abroad contributes to peace and safety at home. You know, there are a number of different operations that Canada has continued throughout the pandemic. And there are three that I want to zoom in on that really relate back to some of the findings that that we had seen in the index and, and Michael had spoken to. You know, what IEP found was Ukraine and Iraq had the largest improvements in the Global Peace Index. And in both countries, Canada has been an active leader and contributor to global peace. With the Op Reassurance, which is actually currently Canada's largest current international military operation from on land in Latvia with the Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group to the air with an air task force, Romania. In the sea, Commodore Bradley Pitts, who I've also had the pleasure of meeting myself, is in command of the standing NATO Maritime Group One and will lead the mission until January of next year. There is HMCS Halifax, who actually just wrapped up the exercise last month, Exercise Steadfast Defender 21, which was a large scale maritime exercise uh, with NATO. There's also Operation Unifier, and every six months until March of next year, Canada deploys 200 members of the Canadian Armed Forces to help Ukraine to remain sovereign, to remain secure, and to remain stable. Now, zooming in to Iraq, which is the other country that has seen the greatest uh, increase that we've seen on the index, Operation Impact, which is where Canada's supporting that global coalition to counter terrorism um, in the Middle East. And that's something that's actually been further extended into the end of March of 2022. NATO Mission Iraq, more specifically, is a non-combat training um, mission that's a part of Operation Impact. And that's something that Canada continues to contribute to, to build up the local capacity of the security and defense with um, Iraqi defense forces. Now, Canada, let's bring it back to Canada and NATO as we look ahead to a post-COVID world. I know the NATO spending target is one that features prominently. Everyone likes to really zero in on that 2%. And year over year from 2019 to 2020, Canada's military spending as a percentage of GDP actually increased over 8.5%. And it was 1.4% as of 2020. This puts Canada among the top 15 in the world and is six in NATO. But that's also just defense spending. That, and, and from my perspective, I'd argue not necessarily the most effective measure of the burden sharing. There are other considerations as well that ultimately contribute to international peace and safety. Now, when we look at starting to look ahead in the most recent federal budget, 2021, it earmarked $1.23 billion over five years to further invest in Canada's security. 
and 847.1 million of that, or nearly 70% of, of that amount is specifically allocated to NATO. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention kind of the efforts of what we're doing at the NATO Association of Canada to educate Canadians on Canada's contributions to international peace and safety and the rules-based order, as well as why it's important that we work alongside our allies and partners in NATO and how that helps to contribute to peace and safety abroad and ultimately the same at home. Things that we're working on are a massive online course to be able to educate young people. We have an incredible ongoing ambassador speaker series and we've hosted over 40 ambassadors now from not just across NATO, but also our partners for peace and, and other countries that we're so thrilled to, to continue to work with as well as a podcast series. Now, with that in mind and that kind of contextualizing everything, let's take a look at Canada and what post COVID might look like. You know, we have seen with the work, the great work at IEP, um, some of the research talked about how economic recovery is a key factor in civil unrest. And after the worst year on record, the Canadian economy now enters kind of 2021 with some rapid growth. 6.5% in the first quarter of 2021, actually slightly above the United States. And unemployment has gone down, but we're not out of the woods yet. And in fact, the Canadian economy lost 68,000 jobs last month. And so our unemployment rate still remains quite high and one in 12 Canadians are without a job. Now, there are other aspects that we have to consider specific to, to Canada. There are many countries around the world are facing various challenges and pressures. Um, one that's unique for Canada though, and, and an aspect to consider as we look towards um, different concerns, we're by no means immune from civil unrest. And one thing that Canada is facing are the historical tragedies and horrors of residential schools. And Canada must face that truth of the legacy of residential schools. And that's a journey towards reconciliation that will be hard in, in many respects. And I think an aspect, I'm having trouble hearing. An aspect for us to consider uh, with regards to, to peace. Now, with that economic kind of recovery aspect in mind, Canada has had some really strong social and economic responses. And I think that's probably one of the takeaways that other countries can look towards is the large investments that the government has been willing to make to be able to ensure that you're investing in and accelerating the economic recovery. In uh, civil unrest and, you know, the, the quicker the recovery, the less the civil unrest uh, might be. And, and I think there are a number of aspects that are unique to, to Canada in terms of how our response has been, which has been uh, very significant in just the amount of dollars that the government has relied with the social equity lens. You know, the, the investments in supporting indigenous businesses, which ties back to this as a country with regards to residential schools, but also um, with regards to systemic racism. Um, those are all challenges that this country needs to confront and face and, and address. And those all factor into the peace and safety event. There was also, I think, a $200 million endowment that the most recent budget invested in with regards to supporting black led um, My uh, civilian team had the honor of being able to work on. And these are all kind of examples of things that I think um, to help with that post COVID recovery and to contribute to peace. When I'm looking ahead to, to kind of climate change and I really want to, to highlight, and this is something that I think factors into NATO and ultimately in international peace and safety. And when we're, we're looking ahead, I really believe that COVID-19 was a dress rehearsal face during COVID 
um, I think will look like very, will look like nothing when we look at the magnitude of of the climate change and the increased instability and and as a result conflicts that arise from scarce resources from extreme weather. I hope you know in reading the Global Peace Index that going forward will continue to kind of be be further captured. Um, the impact of climate change on global peacefulness. As well as within NATO, there's been that commitment to addressing the threat of climate change. And it provides suggestions for, for kind of future considerations that uh, with other uh, NATO young leaders uh, as part of NATO 2030 was really look at the impact of climate deal to work together across NATO within the alliance, but also through the alliance, work with other countries that may not be currently. And I think Kevin, nothing, at least for me, is more harrowing than... Kevin, I'm not two. sure if you can, I'm not sure if you can hear us. I'm sorry for interrupting. There seem to be some audio issues. Is there any chance that you could mute and unmute perhaps to see if it if it um, if it's fixed, mute, unmute. Is that any better? No, unfortunately, we're hearing your voice very low, uh, very sort of um, low in terms of frequency. I see. That's interesting. Okay, hmm. let me dial in. Well, actually, Kevin, how much is left to your presentation? Well, I'm I'm literally just at the end now. Why don't, so what, all I'm simply going to do, the numbers on the screen here are the consequences of necessarily of us not acting. And, and ultimately, I think hopefully this really helps to convey how vital it is um, in addressing climate change because of the impact it can have and will have on Thank you so much, Kevin. I really, really appreciate those those thoughts. Um, and while we um, kind of deal with the audio issue, let me go ahead and pass the first two questions um, to Michael in regards to some of the findings from the Global Peace Index. Um, so Michael, one of the things you mentioned um, was talking about the militarization domain um, that's in the GPI. In 2020, specifically, the militarization domain had one of the largest deteriorations, um, particularly in military expenditure. But prior to that, longer trends reported that militarization um, were actually improving. So how do we interpret kind of what's going on um, in the data, both in the short term and in the long term? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And, and I'd actually like to, to hear the, the opinion of the rest of the group of because in all likelihood, they'll be a lot more informed than I am. Uh, but there's a, the sort of a couple of things that I could say. I mean, number one, this, this, this sort of longer um, trend that we uh, have seen over the last 10 years of, of a decrease in militarization has been broken over the last couple of years. Um, it should be noted, though, that in terms of sort of military expenditure, uh, which is kind of sort of weighted relatively heavily on the whole sort of militarization domain, some of that um, relates, I mean, we've accounted for that, but in the pure numbers, some of it also relates to the impact of COVID. Why? Because the, um, a lot of it is based on a percentage of GDP. Now, GDPs have significantly fallen also in the last year because of COVID-19, whereas the earmarks set aside for, for investment in the military have been maintained. Um, but even when you do take into account that, that difference, you do continue to see that shift in levels of militarization on the road uh, around the world. I mean, we do see that um, as a, um, uh, you know, a symptom of the uh, increasing political instability around the world and, and the, the geopolitical uh, tensions. Um, but I'd love, to, I'd love to hear the opinions of the rest of the group. Definitely. Um, in which case, I, I'd love to invite Ted if he wanted to elaborate on any of those thoughts regarding trends in militarization. Oh, Ted, I think you're muted. Yeah, co common mistake there. Um, 
It's interesting how NATO works and, in fact, uh, how I can see the IEP uh, data work into that. So, for example, um, Kevin gave some big numbers on climate change. Uh, there was a lot of zeros uh, at the end of that. Um, but, Michael, you also gave uh, some big numbers in the trillions, uh, you know, 15 trillion and then uh, saving 10 trillion of that potentially to, to, to be shifted back to some kind of other economic um, factors. But I'm wondering um, where the two circles may intersect is in terms of climate change. So one of the numbers you give as a savings, just 10% uh, at 1.5 trillion and, and the huge number that um, Kevin gave, if, if if within the peace index and within NATO's activities, if that number, uh, if that amount of money can be somehow brought together in a, in a global uh, coalition where we could apply that to um, climate benefit, to climate change, to environmental cleanup. What, what do you both think about um, of moving in that direction where, where savings can be uh, basically into a global fund to, to address our global issues in that area? Yeah, Kevin, I'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe this is a good time for an audio check from your end. Yeah, so I've, I've dialed in here and so hopefully uh, it's, it's a lot better um, using using this um i see you nodding so that's that's a good thing um you know I, I i think mitigation is always cheaper than having to deal with the consequences of of something right and and i think one of the things that i hope people are taking away when they're looking at these huge dollars you know 14 trillion i i had trouble actually fitting the amount of zeros on there but i i wanted to present it that way to really help to visually demonstrate to people just how significant of an amount that is. And so if that is what it's going to cost us every year, how much can we invest now and save later? And, and I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to be able to work together through, you know, vital forms like, like NATO, where there's already an existing framework for how countries can work together and we're, we're already doing so uh, to be able to, to work together on issues of conflict. Well, we know climate change is going to contribute to conflict in the future. So why don't we now leverage NATO and other uh, very similar institutions to be able to work together on climate change? That's, that's a great answer, Kevin. Um, and I wanted to actually transition to one of the audience questions, um, which was about how regional or international organizations such as NATO, such as the OSCE in Europe or the UN globally, um, how, do the, how, do, how can we leverage those partnerships to kind of change those levels in, in, in global peacefulness? Kevin, this question was for you, but I'm happy to pass it on to you. Is that, oh, okay, sure. Yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't sure, sure who you were asking. Um, I, I think one of the things that, you know, we're, at least from, from my perspective, we're seeing is there's, there's already a number of forums that exist. You know, every time I, I see kind of a criticism that, oh, you know, um, it shouldn't be at the G7, it should be discussed uh, somewhere else. I, I think there are, because there are already existing for, like, those are often great places to start to be able to really deal with these challenges that go beyond any one country's borders. And, and again, I think this is where, uh, you know, looking back at NATO, sure, it, it, it starts as, you know, a military alliance, but there are, it goes above and beyond that. And, you know, one of the, the articles there uh, that's been nicknamed kind of the, the Canadian one uh, came from, you know, uh, I, us actually recognizing that there is also a need to be able to build those social and economic ties that, you know, there's a lot that we share with regards to uh, various cultures and values. And, and I think as Canadians, we, we see that, uh, you know, almost every day because the world lives in Canada and, and there's someone from every country who, who calls, you know, Canada home. And, and I think that's been vital in helping us and our recovery and is something that I think other countries can, can seek to emulate as well. Thanks so much for that answer. Um, Michael, this question is to, to you and it comes from the audience. Um, this person is really curious about the, the safety and security domain. 
And um, are there any patterns in which certain countries are be able to improve um, their level in that domain? And if so, what is going on when they do? Yeah, absolutely. So with regards to, to the safety and, and security uh, domain, uh, we're talking about a variety uh, of things. Some of them uh, are very concrete. Some of them are perhaps more qualitative in, in nature. So, you know, with regards to very specific rates, you can talk about homicide rates. You can talk about rates of incarceration. You can talk about uh, the number of police per 100,000 people, for example. And then more broadly, you can talk about sort of the likelihood of of demonstrations, perceptions of, of, uh, of uh, criminality, of violent crime, et cetera. Um, you know, I did mention that, that, you know, when the Global Peace Index was first developed, that the expert uh, panel and the Institute chose to give sort of a more significant weighting to the internal dynamics or internal levels of peacefulness within a country, uh, because we do, uh, you know, believe that that is kind of sort of required to be able to have the strength to be able to operate internationally in an effective and, and, certain, and, and in a non-negative way, I should say. Um, in terms of kind of sort of key uh, recommendations, I mean, it is very contextual and perhaps Perhaps I'd kind of sort of defer back to our positive peace research, and and you know, um, you know, in a nutshell, um, there's a variety of kind of sort of different factors that come into play when it comes to creating um, and sustaining peace over the long term. So, in kind of sort of non-technical terms, and to kind of make it as intuitive as possible, we talk about it in terms of the eight pillars of positive peace. And we see the countries with the highest levels of, of internal peacefulness as well as external peacefulness over time, have a well-functioning government, an equitable distribution of resources, free flow of information, um, uh, good relations with neighbors, high levels of human capital, uh, acceptance of the rights of others, lower levels of corruption, and a sound business environment. Now, you know, no country has all, you know, it does amazingly in all of these things. But what we do find is that the countries that improve the most internally do so by making small, um, uh, progressive, but simultaneous shifts to all of these pillars. Um, so, so that, you know, that is something that any country can kind of sort of work on at the, at the policy uh, level, but also at the community level as well. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I continue to encourage um, those in the audience to submit more questions in the Q&A. Um, but for now, Kevin, I have a question to ask um, you regarding some of the findings that Canada um, reported in the GPI. This year, Canada, as we saw, ranked 10th on the Global Peace Index and actually increased their levels in peacefulness as compared to last year, which is a pretty big feat considering the events of 2020 and the statistic that you shared about one in 10 Canadians having their job security affected. So what can other countries learn, especially the ones that Canada has probably a strong economic presence or on the ground presence? What can, others, what can other countries learn um, in terms of how Canada was able to increase their levels of peacefulness? I, I think one thing that stands out to me is, you know, we in Canada, what we did was we leveraged the strong support and, and logistical expertise of the military. And it was through something called Operation Vector. And, and I have a number of, of my colleagues who are actually taking part in that uh, reservist who kind of put their civilian careers on hold to be able to contribute that. And, and I think that is very much part of that Canadian spirit. You know, when, when there is a need for help, we, we help. And when, when we kind of look at also Canada's really strong economic response to COVID-19, I think that's something that countries can really, really look at because it really builds institutions that contribute to positive peace. I think the last thing that, that I'll share is Canada's strategy is one that recognizes that security is, is a much broader concept than the conventional definition really suggests. And ensuring that Canadians are strong financially contributes to Canada's overarching security and therefore peace. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, um, as we're coming um, closer towards the end of the hour, I wanted to pass it again um, to Ted for any additional comments or questions. Oh, first of all, this is absolutely fascinating, but I, but I do have one more for Michael and, and something that um, Kevin brought up in terms of um, the impact uh, of, um, you know, the, the um, 
residential schools and, and the, the issues that we have in Canada around that sort of thing right now. Because right now, it's, as we saw, we're, we're 10th uh, on the list. But in, in your future data gathering, how, how do you think that's going to impact Canada's standing on your list? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting uh, uh, question, uh, Ted. I think uh, you know, in terms of the way that we measure it uh, currently, it would probably depend more on what is the actual outcome of those events. I mean, this may have already been reflected um, in sort of previous, for example. I mean, this has been a, an issue that has been um, that that, that has, has been around for for a long time, and is in, you know, people are increasingly becoming more and more aware of it. Um, so, you know, it will ultimately depend on what the outcome of that is, whether it is an increase in civil unrest, whether it is an increase in, in political instability uh, or violent demonstrations. That may or may not be the case. Um, that is, those are the metrics that we would track. Um, we sort of stop short of usually of talking about causality of any of those metrics, because usually it is a, a, a combination of a lot of different things. Um, but, um, but, you know, to the extent that it, that it would have sort of an impact on, on those metrics, we would definitely look into it. And the other thing I would say is that we're always trying to Im improve the way or increase, you know, or the, 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 the quantitative nature of the indicators that we use. Um, so, you know, we, we continue to look forward to kind of sort of making this um, research more comprehensive as time goes by. Well, thank you so much. Um, what a note to end on. And I want to, again, thank both of our guests and to Jessica for moderating this discussion today. We invite you all to stay engaged and to subscribe to our channel on YouTube and to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to make sure you don't miss any of our future events and to ensure to stay involved in the essential conversations about Canada's peace and security. Thank you so much for joining us today. And until next time, have a great afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.